Dr. Earl Harley. He's a pediatric otolaryngologist, uh, sometimes known as an ENT. He's practicing here in DC. He's a widely respected doctor and faculty member at Georgetown MedStar University Hospital. His talk today concerns tonsillectomy, including microbiome and immunology in the select population. Please welcome Dr. Harley. Thank you, Tim. And uh, thanks to the Pandas Network, Diana Pullman, and thanks for everybody to come out to, to hear this talk today. And I'm glad to be following Dr. Kovacevic because a lot of what I have to say actually corroborates what his talk was about, some of his clinical experience. We actually have some research data that actually supports everything he said. So this is a great follow-on to, to Dr. Kovacevic. So this is the title of my talk, The Otolaryngologist, or ENT, and the role of tonsillectomy in pandas and autoimmune encephalitis. So we as otolaryngologists, the pediatric otolaryngologists, or, or, or general, because a lot of communities don't have pediatric otolaryngology, but even a general otolaryngology, because tonsillectomy is basically the, the first thing you learn as, a, as an otolaryngology resident, so any ENT doctor can do this. But our role is unique in this devastating disorder because our ability to remove the tonsils, thereby allowing us to study the biology of the disease, of this disorder. And following on that, we can actually disrupt the disease, the disease processes, I, I, I put it, and I have some data to talk about the disruption. But tonsillectomy is a serious disorder. I know some of the parents, I've actually had some of the family members here, patients I've treated, but tonsillectomy is a serious disorder, a serious uh, operation, not to be taken lightly. Sometimes you hear some of my non-surgical colleagues talk about, well, just snatch those tonsils out as if you're pulling a hangnail or something like that. So it has to be undertaken seriously because there are, you know, besides, you know, certainly there's pain. Uh, and, and pain can be significant, but pain is also subjective. Uh, the most common issue we see with tonsillectomy is dehydration. Uh, bleeding is rare, only 2 to 3 percent, but can be serious. Uh, reaction to the anesthesia. And there's always the elephant in the room. Uh, one, depending on who you read, one in 15 to 30,000 tonsillectomies, there's a death, usually it's from bleeding. So you just don't just run in, okay, I'm going to yank these tonsils out. No, you got to be considerate. So that's just to start out, just to say it's a serious consideration. Uh, we'll go into some of that later. And we've had many successes, some here in the room, but our successes are tempered by our failures. And this is one of the failures that I'm going to talk about here in a second. One of the things that, that kind of brings you back down, burst your bubble, and I'm not sure if this family here, I'm not going to use that name, obviously. So nine-year-old, um, abrupt onset, OCD, anxiety, emotional ability, or depression, irritable, aggressive, oppositional behavior, not doing well in school, some sensory and motor disorders, somatic problems such as not sleeping, any rhesus. And day with daytime frequency. As, as the parents answered earlier, this child has seen many physicians, neurologists, psychiatrists, brain therapists, infectious disease, otolaryngologists, have been on long-term antibiotics, steroid, corticosteroids, on the schizophrenic meds, SSRIs, and, and the like, IVIG, et cetera. Um, so, patients saw me, did the tonsillectomy, but it didn't improve. So, in desperation, mom consulted another doctor who told her that her son was highly misbehaving, under control, in, in, according to her, he was under control in two weeks after seeing this other Dr. Stein. His son is happier, more responsible, and more in control. And so this is the, this next slide is what really hit home to me. Well, and this is, quote, these are quotes from the letter. And I'm not sure if she sent this letter to all of her physicians, five or six as she had seen, but she sent it to me. Uh, we believe each of you, so she must have the way, because this is verbatim, did your best. We know you believe in medications and procedures, but our son needed us to be better parents. We beg you to read Dr. Stein's book and apply them to your practice and seek the truth. So this is from a parent. 
So this is sobering uh, to know that this is how, and this was a while ago, we, we took this, we put this in perspective. So there are some successes, but, but there are obviously some failures, and maybe it was a failure of diagnosis. I don't remember the case as well. Uh, maybe we could have done, but as you can see, the patient had had everything. Uh, but anyway, so that's just a sobering case history there. So there's a dilemma, though. Dilemma, uh, there's controversy in the medical community, but in the lay community. So as we can see, this picture here from the Wall Street Journal, a uh, national uh, respected paper, uh, asking the question, the strip causing your child to be sick, basically. And so parents, are, they see this, and they may notice the, the anxieties, the behavior problems, and they read this uh, in the Wall Street Journal. And then, then we have this. I'm not sure if Beth is here. Uh, this book that many of you are familiar with called Saving Sammy, uh, where mom's quest to, to find the right treatment for her son. So it, it chronicles her quest going up and down the East Coast. So you have the lay community parents like you uh, want to do the best for your child and as you'll see you're being told number one sometimes you, you're being told that there's no such thing as pandas that's the first thing and if there is tonsillectomy is not the right treatment so 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 that's so go back to the medical community the confusion there there's a lack of a biological markers so which we're working on we're actually finding some markers and then there's the association in other words is this, is the anxiety just an association, they just happen to have strep, or is there causality? And that's what we're trying to, trying to focus on, whether that's causality here. So as we look, and there's some other, I know Dr. Pasternak talked about some of the historical perspectives, and this is one almost 100 years ago, um, this article from the psychiatry and neurology literature saying that infections cause ticks. I mean, so people have known this, we talked about Sidney Ham's career was even farther back in history. So it's not far-fetched to know that, that there are certain infections that uh, produce uh, neurological symptoms. But there are powerful forces out there. And one of the most powerful, which I'm a member of American Academy of Pediatrics. I was a pediatrician before I was an ENT. But anyway, and I'm still a member. But the, uh, and you'll see some of the, the verbiage from the American Academy of Pediatrics. I just snapped this out from the AAP News from two years ago. Uh, as you can see, it says, experts are skeptical, but who are the experts? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we have Dr. Latimer, she's an expert. They probably didn't ask her, but anyway. So, <laughs> so, so that's, that's, those are the forces we're up against. But this is the Red Book. So the Red Book is like the Bible to the pediatricians. American Academy uh, Pediatrics Red Book, right? <laughs> right. So here, so they don't even acknowledge, and this is cut and pasted. I didn't retire. This is a cut and paste, so there's no misspelling or anything because it's cut and paste. It does not acknowledge the relationship between pandas and, and, and group A strep. So, and, um, and this, again, is out of the Red Book. Don't even talk about tonsillectomy. They say no antibiotics, no IVIG, no plasmapheresis, and that's their misspelling, by the way. They, they call it IGIV, because it's a cut and paste, too. <laughs> so, so, and, or plasmapheresis, plasma exchange, and later on they said just simply send your child to a therapist. So this is, these are the forces that we're against uh, as parents to try to get the right treatment get somebody to recognize that it's just not a tick. And then the confusion continues on into my community. So our guidelines, first promulgated in 2011 and then more recently, doesn't recommend tonsillectomy. As a matter of fact, it recommends against it. Now, all the guidelines on tonsillectomy, when it comes to pandas, they said it's unproven. So, so my colleagues, and that's why so many parents may have trouble finding and otolaryngologists in your community who will do a tonsillectomy. And I just got, just last week, I don't know, a parent may be in the room here, got, they went to Johns Hopkins, and the guy who was a year behind me in fellowship was the one who saw him, said, we don't do that. We don't take tonsils out for that. Because he's probably following the guidelines. But 
guidelines, and I tell my residents at Georgetown, it's just a guideline. It's not the Bible. You know, it's not a commandment. It's a guideline. Yet people are now taking guidelines as the gospel. And, it's, well, the, and this is from our, the American Academy of Laryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, which is right up the street, the headquarters right up the street, says the consulectomy is not recommended in uh, PANDAS. So that's the forces within our community. And this is uh, the, con the, so the PANS consensus, uh, the consortium, that I know Dr. Latimer was a part of it. They, they were silent on tonsillectomy. They didn't recommend for it. They were just silent. Just, it doesn't exist, uh, not that it doesn't exist, but uh, just nothing to say about tonsillectomy. So, so the question becomes, uh, is tonsillectomy appropriate? Uh, well, when it was called PANDAS, I know there's this move to change the name. When it was called PANDAS, it was a little clear, more clear cut because the PANDAS meant strep. Strep means you could qualify for having your tonsils out. However, if you look at the indications for strep, and our guidelines do recommend tonsillectomy for strep throat, recurrent strep throat, but you have to look at the guidelines. The guidelines quote a thing known as the Paradise Criteria by Dr. Jack Paradise out of Pittsburgh. I don't know if anybody's here from Pittsburgh, um, who's done a lot of work in tonsils. So Dr. Paradise said, you need to have seven strep throat or pharyngitis with fever and adenopathy, you know, swollen glands a year to qualify. That's based on one year's worth of symptoms. Or over two years, you need to have five of these so-called strep or pharyngitis with fever and adenopathy, five per year for two years. Or if you can go back three years, you only need to have three per year. To, and these should be documented. So few of our patients, some do, that I see with pandas, but most of them can't meet the paradise criteria. So we're in a dilemma as far as to recommending tonsillectomy. Well, you don't, because the insurance companies get a hold of this. Well, well, how many strep throats? Well, you had one six months ago. And I, I just had a patient within the last week or so. The, her, her last strep throat was... I think it was in June. I just took her tonsils out, and what do you know? There's strep in her tonsils. She hasn't had, not had a sore throat. There's strep in her tonsils that were just, and they were deep because I was going to how I do, and I call them core, and they're deep within the tonsils. They're not so. Um, the throat culture would have been negative. She did have elevated ASO titus, which I guess was the tip off. But but if you just went on stroke, throat culture, she hasn't had a strep throat, and the throat culture is negative, so she doesn't qualify. So. So based on, on that, that assessment. So now it's not as easy. I know the name is starting to emerge. You know, there was pandas from Dr. Sweeto back in 98, and then pans, and now name changes are being entertained, basal ganglia, encephalitis, immune encephalitis. So it takes the strep out of it. So now you say immune encephalitis, it doesn't even, although there are many uh, organisms that can cause it. I can see the rationale, but but there's no strep in the name immune encephalitis, so it makes it even more difficult. Uh, we just barely got a, a code. Uh, we call them ICD-10 codes. These are our, our diagnosis codes that we use. Everything, every disorder has a, a code called ICD-10, used to be ICD-9. We just got a code for pandas. Before, we, didn't even, we couldn't even code it because there was nothing So we, within the last two or three years. So, so that was... So that's the issues we're up against. The so-called experts are saying either pandas doesn't exist or tonsillectomy is the right, not the right operation. So I wanted to see what the parents' perspective, but first I want to tell a, another sad story. So, so and I, again, I don't know if any of these parents are here. They may be from, this is family from Texas, Dallas, Texas came to me all the way halfway across the country to get the tonsils out. But the pediatrician told them, if you go to Georgetown and get your tonsils out, you have to find a new practice. So they drew him out of the practice. So one of our residents was from Dallas, and so I went to Matt. Do you know a pediatrician in Dallas? You know, that's how bad it is out there. They would, and, and I've had other parents tell me that pediatricians laughed at them when they mentioned pandas, because parents are 
are finding this on the internet, and the pediatricians are laughing, denied it, and so it's it's they're they're desperate. But anyway, so so again, the expert the experts are saying tonsillectomy is not recommended. So I said, why don't we ask the parents how the parents feel? And one of the things I was saying yesterday, because all of our students at Georgetown have to have research to graduate, so they're always looking for projects. And as a matter of fact, if you want a competitive residency like ENT, you need three or four projects. But anyway, so I have plenty of help. So why don't we, one of our studies, why don't we just look at our database in the time we had 167, and we went through the Institutional Review Board, so all the ethical things were, were answered. So let's query our database. We identified these 167 children. Now, not all 167 had surgery. Uh, it's just that every child I see, I've started to put them on a spreadsheet so I could go to my, my spreadsheet. And then 167 identified, 97 parents responded, and 60 completed the survey. As you can see at the bottom here, this is current. This is being presented uh, in two months in San Diego at the Society for Ear, Nose, and Throat Advances in Children. So it's very current data that we'll present and, and also bring some light to what parents are going through and how parents feel rather than what the so-called experts are saying. So, so number one, so it's retrospective. In other words, we called them up after the fact, after the, and from, it was very in periods of time, but we did put a lot of time limit. We didn't call anybody. I have to look at the data. I think it was, it had to be at least six months out. We didn't, so we didn't want somebody we just done last month. We wanted them to have time to recover. So everybody was on antibiotics, fine. But 83% of these patients had tonsillectomy. Then you see 40% with IVIG, 15% rituximab, and then corticosteroids, 12%, and the plasma exchange, 10%. So this is the treatment. And some of these patients had more than one treatment. As, a matter of fact, as you can see, everybody had antibiotics. So some had antibiotics plus tonsillectomy or so. And so this is what the parents had to say. Tonsillectomy was the most effective. Some of you in the room may have answered this questionnaire. Uh, and would choose again, and that says a lot. 80% knowing, um, anybody who's gone through, knowing that it's, it's a week of pain, you're out of school, um, you have to worry about bleeding, you have to worry about dehydration, and yet 80% said we'll do it again. And not only will we do it again, we would recommend it to others. So this is how parents felt, or not felt, but are feeling about the role of tonsillectomy. Uh, symptoms decreased over time, uh, actually regardless of, tr of, of treatment, uh, but tonsillectomy was preferred and said tonsillectomy had the greatest impact. So that's a parent's view of this disorder. So looking at the literature though, the literature doesn't really support it. Um, is that there's a bunch of anecdotal cases, an anecdotal cases, and then there's some cases that are kind of some, some efficacy, but some not efficacious. So, I mean, this study out of Cincinnati, you can say, I mean, this are, these are anecdotes. You know, two brothers, had one on OCD, one ticks. We don't even know if it was pandas, but this was said to be a pandas case. I mean, I know the authors. Uh, and so both better after tonsillectomy. Uh, another anecdote, this was out of New York, uh, out of Albert Einstein in New York. It's, it's fairly well quoted too, by the way. Um, but patients improved after tonsillectomy even when they didn't, so even those who didn't improve on antibiotics, tonsillectomy was beneficial. And then another anecdote, this is just one child. So these are just single cases, 11-year-old pandas, better after tonsillectomy. Uh, here's one, recurrent tonsillitis, neuropsychiatric symptoms, well after a, a year, single case reports. Here's a prospective study, in other words, it was a forward-looking study, not, not backward. So 120 patients, so, so, and they're almost equally divided, and followed fairly closely every two months for two years, but saying that there was no difference in the treatment group, so that's sort of equivocal, and so there are people who look at that. And then here's another study, uh, review, this is a review article. They had six cases, uh, reports, which means there was just one or two patients per, which may be some of the same ones I just quoted, but six of those case reports that supported tonsillectomy, but three case series that didn't support it, again, is a draw. So 
And here's one, another one, five articles on tonsillectomy, low level of evidence. So low level of evidence means it may have just been a, a single case. I mean, a high level of evidence would be something like we call like a systematic review, a meta-analysis, where you do a complete literature search and, and, and weed out the articles that don't fit. So those would be high level. These are low level, so one or two cases. They're saying um, five articles, no clear benefit, Three articles, conflicting results with antibiotics, uh, IBIG, some benefit, um, cognitive behavioral therapy showed benefit. So that's, um, that's the literature. So it's, the literature's all over the place. Not really, there's really not great support out there. And then uh, I didn't put Tanya Murphy's paper up here uh, from Tampa. And Tanya Murphy basically said there's no benefit either. She's a well-known PANDAS researcher down at the University of South Florida. So again, we looked at our own data because we see quite a few patients. It, oops, let's go back. There it is. So this is a retrospective again. So what we did is, my arrow, there it is. So this is pre-op of the ones, not everybody had surgery, pre-op, this is post-op. These are the groups uh, antibi antibiotics, tonsillectomy, then we had IVIG, then tonsillectomy, tonsillectomy, then IVIG, and then we had IVIG, tonsillectomy, followed by IVIG. And here on the y-axis is what I call the domains, which are just the, the symptoms, the OCDs, the tics, the behavior. And this actually supports, when you drill it down, you can't see it from here, you drill it down, it actually supports what Dr. Kovacevic was saying that the children who benefited most are those in, in terms of IVIG. IVIG was more effective if they had a tonsillectomy first, and that's what the data is. So even if they had already had IVIG, tonsillectomy, and got it again, uh, so it does enhance, tonsillectomy does enhance uh, the efficacy of IVIG, and we think we have some to support that as well. And so this is part of that that same study. Um, so these are, these are called odds, odds ratios. So the higher, like these are all significant. So the odds of having this symptom before tonsillectomy, in other words, tonsillectomy made them better. So after tonsillectomy, this number would be lower. So OCD, seven over seven. You can see ticks. You can see there's uh, the, you know, the urinary problems. The, the anxiety. So all these, all these, these uh, numbers: four, six, four, four, five, ten, nine, seven. Means that the odds ratio that these symptoms would resolve with tonsillectomy were great. So he here at the bottom two with the p values of less than point, point five, point oh five. You see the coriform movements didn't improve that much and some of the behavior, regressive behavior. The anxiety improved, but some of the regressive. So again, this is a, an, again, retrospective, small study. Uh, this is one of our students. Uh, this is an intern, actually, Dr. Latimer had hired for the summer who looked through the data. Uh, so small study, but, but everything is supporting what we're saying. Uh, so this is another study, again, because we have so many um, students. So something Dr. Latimer was involved with us. So this is Mark Russo here. Russo is now a resident, but he was a student when he did this. So, and these are, pros this is prospective now. In other words, we look forward, and we went through the, the regular process, the, the Institutional Review Board, to get approval, make sure there are no ethical violations. Uh, parents had to consent to this. We weren't just doing research. Although it, it wouldn't change the surgery at all, but, but you can't just do research on, on a child with parent, without the parent's consent. So we went through, we got proper consent. And so we had two groups of patients. So we had a control group. We had our, the pandas patients, which are black, in the black, and we had the non-pandas, which were in the, black, in, in the white. And so what I did, these patients all had tonsillectomy. We took them to surgery. Once I took the first tonsil out, I went to the back table, actually opened the tonsil up, and did what I call a core culture, put it in the transport medium, and then put it in ice right there in the operating room. Then I finished the operation because the child is still asleep, only has one tonsil out. So I go back, finish the operation, child safely in the recovery room, 
and then we take it directly to the lab. So that's how this was done. We do it a little bit differently now, but just to show the methodology, that it was valid, the methodology was valid. So, but what I want to show is the difference in the asterisks here show that there's statistical difference in the pandas versus the non-pandas and why here and here. So this is, this is staph over here, staph aureus, which is very common. But you see there's a lot of staph, there's more in the non-pandas group, but a lot of staph and pandas. And we can talk about that in a second. Uh, MRSA, which is resistant staph, methicillin resistant, MRSA, methicillin resistant staph. You see it in the pandas, you didn't see it in the, the non pandas. By the way, the non pandas were children who were having surgery for either recurrent strep throat, not pandas related, but recurrent strep throat, or they had sleep apnea. So if you look here in this third column, this is the strep column, group A, beta hemolytic strep. So our control group, there was strep. There was no strep in our pandas patient. So we've since, we changed our methodology, we have more sensitive ways of doing it, we've since found strep, but in this cohort, there was no strep. But we found the strep viridins uh, in both groups, which is not surprising, you find that in the mouth. But what was significant was this group, here, the anaerobes, and I'll talk about anaerobes in the next slide or so. But we had some other, some unusual organisms. We had what we call gram negatives. We had serratia. We had some pseudomonas. We had uh, some E. coli. But so this shows this is the and this is part of the microbiome of the tonsils, and it's significant, uh, believe it or not. I didn't compare this. So we did some studies with uh, University of Minnesota, Dr. Pat Cleary, who attended the first conference that we did three years ago. Uh, we collaborated, and he's a PhD strep biologist, but they needed clinical material. So I would take the tonsils out and put them on ice and prepare them and send them to Minnesota. And, and he did some, some studies. And what he was showing that, um, so he incubated the tonsils some of the cells that we sent in from the tonsil tissue with both strep as, as well as staph. And you found the same imbalance in this TH17, TH1. Uh, so staph, staph did the same as strep in terms of tonsils. So when we found all this staph in our uh, pandas patients, well, maybe some of those symptoms were staph related. But even more was this. All those anaerobes, the anaerobes are mainly fusobacterium, which is commensal, or it belongs there. Uh, everybody has fusobacterium. And it's, by the way, Dr. Kovacevic just mentioned something that, that actually corroborates this. He mentioned antibiotics for your child who's having a dental procedure. Well, these are dental organisms. Uh, they're always there. And this is what we find in the most of. We find in all these anaerobes, and even our newer technology, newer technique that we're using now, we're still finding it. So, but what I want to point out is these are, in, in health, they're, they're just sitting there, but in, in disease, these are serious organisms. Necroforum, so Fusobacterium necroforum is found in a serious um, life-threatening disease called Lemire's syndrome, where you actually clot off your internal jugular vein, you get a, a septic thrombus, and, and so this is a, a mouth bacteria. But this one, Fusobacterium nucleatum, this has been associated with, with Alzheimer's disease. So it's not a far-fetched thing. Well, if, if you have something in the, 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 we're taking out of these tonsils that cause other neurologic disorders like Alzheimer's, well, can it cause pandas and immune encephalitis? So these are, so we think, we think this is significant. And after my talk yesterday, Dr. Belanti, who's an immunologist from Georgetown, was in the audience yesterday. So we talked after, the, after my talk about just about this. And so I'm actually teaming up. We're going to meet with his lab this week uh, to talk more about this, because this, this is significant. We're finding this in the tonsils. And then we also treat them, because what we're, we're not only finding fusobacteria, but we're finding others. We're finding three, four, five bacteria in every tonsil. Majority of them did have fusobacterium. And what we're using now, we're using what's called next generation sequencing, the PCR next generation sequencing, where they actually look at the DNA of the bacteria. So these are not 
regular cultures that you put in an incubator and look at them in 48 hours. So these are high tech, high technology, next generation sequencing is how, and that's how we found the strep, the, the streps that we found. We found them using the next generation sequences, but we're finding lots, there's lots of data. So the thinking now is there's a biofilm. The biofilm, I know many people uh, may not be medical here. So a biofilm is a community of bacteria. It's a bacteria that lives in a community. You have three, four, or five bacteria. They're kind of encased, uh, they're like walled off, but they're, in the, and that's some, sometimes when you have certain infections that are not responding to antibiotics because they're within this, this matrix, the so-called biofilm. So we think this may be a biofilm taking on the characteristic of the dominant yeah, which is um, Fusobacterium. We, that's just a, a thought. But we do treat these, although it's commensal, we do treat them. And one of the reasons I treat them is based on this. Okay, and then we found several cases with Serratia, which is Marsan, which is another serious organism, gram negative serious organism. So I took the tonsils out, I cultured the tonsils, but I also cultured the adenoids. And this child had some sinus symptoms. So I cultured the sinuses as well. Well, I had the same bacteria, all three sites. That's the rationale that I'm using. So I'm saying if it's in the tonsils, yeah, we took the tonsils out, but that may not have eradicated this infection. And, and some people may question whether it's really infection or, or just bacteria just there, but anyway. So this is another study that we did. We looked at um, different, different student, Andrew Walls, who. Uh, left Georgetown and went to Yale to do residency. But anyway, um, so let's look at some of the cytokines. These, these bacteria, I mean, sorry, these proteins, sorry, these proteins are in the tonsil cell. Again, this was prospective as well. And, and these are different cohorts of patients. So 12 patients, 12 pandas, six strep, six sleep apneas. Uh, again, IRB, so we had uh, all the ethical concerns where the parents had to. Uh, agree, even though it didn't change anything about the surgery, they still had to agree that we could study their child's uh, tonsils. Normally, we just send them to pathology, but, but this, we did special studies. And so what we found is uh, the cytokine, and the one I want to point out is this top one here, tumor necrosis alpha, very important cytokine. That was increased in the pandas versus the control. But these are the decrease, and the one that Dr. Belanti pointed out to me yesterday he thought it was very significant that the interleukin-10 was decreased while the tumor necrosis alpha was increased. And so he, draw, he, he, made a draw, he drew this for me. Well, I, I did this, but this is sort of what he, we sat down and uh, across the hall yesterday, he looked at this. So the balance is, so you can see there's an imbalance here. And so there's more tumor necrosis alpha, less interleukin 10. So the balance is towards disease, which is the tumor necrosis alpha, which is a cytokine that's stimulating disease. Uh, this is just another study that we did. This is uh, uh, Dilatan and, 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 and um, Dratan out of, uh, Dratan is now in, in New York, Agalu is now in New York, is doing a lot of research, and, uh, which shows um, Again, the, the NALT cells, the NALT are equivalent to adenoids. Uh, when you uh, incubate the group A beta hemolytic strep, you do get the uh, increase in the cytokines, which uh, open up you know, TH17, which produces the interleukin 17A, opening up the, the blood brain barrier, exposing the brain, especially the basal ganglia, to these uh, inflammatory agents. And what they found is not strep. There was no strep in the, in the brain, but you had these inflammatory lymphocytes. So that's an animal model, uh, again, affecting the cardiac nucleus uh, with all the, the putamen, and the globus pallidus in the uh, uh, areas in there, which drive, which drive a lot of the symptoms. We'll talk about this other study. Uh, so we start looking at B cells, because a lot of uh, rituximab, as you can see in my other slide from the parent survey, a fair number of the children had gotten rituximab. Well, rituximab or rituxin is an anti-B. It goes against the B, you know, the, the, the humoral system. So it says, well, then there must be an increase in B cells in the tonsils. So we looked at, again, IRB approved 
Uh, we looked at 22 patients this time, 10 pandas, 10 strep, and, and 10 uh, sleep apnea. So six to sleep apnea, six to six. Um, to see if there's, we looked at B cells and B cell precursors like CD19 and C20, CD20. Uh, we didn't really find, find an increase in B cells in the tonsils, which I was a little bit surprised. Then I was, talked to Dr. Bellati yesterday, and we figured out we might have been looking in the wrong place because uh, we only looked in the tonsils. We didn't look peripherally. We didn't look at blood. So, so that was a little disappointing because uh, we do know that rituximab does benefit children, but, but it's not in the tonsils. So anyway, so tonsillectomy, is it appropriate? And so for whom we agree with Dr. Kovacevic, our data supports that. So the diagnosis, by the way, these children almost always have small tonsils. And so you can't look at the tonsils and say, well, you know, they don't need to come out. I mean, the, the rule is to have small tonsils. Tonsils are great on a score of one through four, where four are so-called kissing tonsils. They're, I mean, they're touching like this, whereas one is you can barely see them. The majority of the children have plus what we call plus one, they're very small, and they may have plus two. Rarely do you see anybody with a three or four. They just don't have big tonsils. They're, they're small, so you can't look at the tonsils, but when we take the tonsils out and we study them, they're full of bacteria. So small, small tonsils, uh, and laboratory data, uh, Cunningham panel, sleep studies. Uh, I'm not sure anybody talked about REM sleep. But. So I'm using tonsillectomy, but what I'm really saying is adenotonsil, or TNA or adenotonsillectomy, because you want to eliminate all of this uh, this, these are the tonsils, so-called palatine tonsils. These are adenoids. This is a ring of tissue that we know as Waldeyer's ring, and all of it is lymphoid tissue. The lymphoid tissue is kind of part of the immune system, which is another question that comes up. If you take the tonsils and adenoids out, what happens to the immune system? And the answer is actually nothing. It doesn't, doesn't cripple the immune system. There have been multiple studies shown. As long as the child is immunocompetent, uh, then taking tonsils and adenoids out will not cripple them. Besides, you leave, you, you never take everything out. You can't get it all out. There's this tissue right here around your station tube. You can't get that out. So there's still some be left behind anyway. So, so what we're doing is we're eliminating the infection that's residing in the tonsils and adenoids. And it's what we call cyto, I call cytoreduction. In other words, you're just reducing the lymphoid tissue in this area of the oral pharynx, in the nasal pharynx, so cytoreduction. And by doing that, you're reducing TH17, so you're removing the antigen. The antigen, by the way, uh, the antigens are the bacteria in the tonsils, and I just showed you all the bacteria. So those are the antigens that are driving the TH17 that's driving the interleukin-17 that's, that's crossing the blood-brain barrier. So, so it, one follows the other. So that's what you're doing by this cytoreduction. Some details, I, I like to stop all medications if they can. Some children will flare, so sometimes we can't, but I like especially the SSRIs, and many children are on SSRIs. What we found, that SSRIs affect platelets, and you can have bleeding. So we just advise them to stop everything if they can, if they can't. Uh, and the reason why we initially stopped the antibiotics is because when we were doing cultures, we wanted pure cultures, we didn't want uh, to come back with a sterile culture because they've been on antibiotics. Um, we send everything for, to the lab, obviously. Any, uh, by the way, if they have sinus symptoms, I'll do some, some minor sinus surgery. I don't do anything major. I'll do something like wash the sinuses out, just enough to get cultures, by the way, not any type of major sinus surgery. Uh, so everything goes to the lab for pathology. They all go for bacteriological uh, analysis now using the next generation sequencing. But it's important that this is uh, core culture, so I open the tonsil up and uh, submit it to, to our lab. We use this microgen, but anyway. Uh, I use perioperative antibiotics. Again, this is the guidelines don't recommend them, but uh, most of the children are already on it, so I just keep them on it. And then when I get my results back, I'll change it. I use corticosteroids for a short course, uh, and I treat the pathogens. And they all, and Dr. Kabasovich talked about this, they all have to go back to neurology in four to six weeks. It doesn't end with tonsillectomy for me. I, uh, but that's, that should be a beginning. Just some cartoons on, so the surgery, this is the position, so-called rose position. 
adenoids. You can see tonsils being taken out, usually rarely they're this large. Adenoids, adenoids sit up in the nasal pharynx, so the nose is up here. So, and there are a variety of ways to take them out, but you know, so you remove all this, reduce all of the, as much of the lymphoid tissue you can, and then this is what you look like immediately post-op. Child, you see they're still on the table. They, they still have the, we call it a mouth gag, the kind of thing that holds the mouth, the jaw open, the endotracheal tube. But this is what it looks like after the tonsils have been removed immediately afterwards. Um, so me and Dr. Latimer got together a couple weeks ago, and we uh, came up with what we call the Georgetown Consensus, uh, that, you know, despite the guidelines, that uh, uh, PANDAS is an independent indication for tonsillectomy. Uh, but you can't, you may still need to use antibiotics. Dr. Kovacevic mentioned some of this earlier. Uh, you may need uh, steroid bursts. Uh, NSAIDs, uh, which is like Motrin or ibuprofen, may be needed uh, occasionally. Uh, may benefit from IVIG afterwards. Uh, plasma exchange with tuximab. And should continue the cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, the, um, the other part of this consensus, which I think is important, is, and this goes along with Dr. Kovacevic, what he's saying in his clinical practice of over 20 years. We think if you make this diagnosis, your child should have the tonsils out within three months. In other words, we want to get the tonsils out before the circulating antibodies get into the bloodstream and affect the basal ganglia. So get the tonsils out early. Uh, I know this could be a hard sell, but... <laughs> But we recommend that tonsils come out early. And also consider family contacts. I mean, I just had another family with two children, one who had pandas and one who didn't, took both of their tonsils out. They both had strep in their tonsils. Uh, so consider, and so if you have another child that has strep, now they could have just been a strep carrier, we don't know. Uh, but the affected child will get these flares because her sister still has strep uh, hidden deep in her tonsils, and these were good core tonsils, tonsil uh, cultures. So tonsil is an adjunct. Improvement is not immediate. So that's why you, know, you can't expect you're going to wake up in a week when all the pain is gone, all your symptoms uh, in terms of your pandas will be gone. No, it takes a while. It's a process. So that's why we say four to six weeks, and you may have these flares and... And you can have some late relapses. That's one of the things. And even some of the adults and older, like teenage children, I suspect they may be late relapses. They, they might have had pandas or some version of pandas as a young child, and now at 18 or 19, this is actually a relapse. So, so controversial disorder, uh, many bacteria induce, can induce it. And what, and what we think, by the way, once strep, initiates the process, sort of opens the gate, the floodgate, anything can come through, including those gram-negative anaerobes that I talked about. So um, it's not a panacea. Um, the bottom line is my colleagues should have an open mind. So, And I know people around the country, because um, I get calls, and I just recommend, and some of them want to come to Georgetown, some of the patients, but like I have a patient right now who's from Atlanta, because they couldn't find anybody in Atlanta. So I did her tonsillectomy on Monday, but she had to stay here for a week. I, you, I can't just do a tonsillectomy and put you on the road, send you back to Georgia. So it's better to have it done in your own hometown, and I do know people in all around. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hurley.